Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word, how you have preserved your written word over thousands of years to us, some of which we'll see tonight. We thank you for the light that it continues to be to our path as if it were written yesterday. Uh, we thank you for um, helping us to hold to these traditions, to continue to practice them in our lives, to teach our children, our grandchildren, to lead our wives, to be a, an example in the church, to be the Christian men you want us to be. Thank you for tonight, the specific passage in Zechariah 12 that we'll look at. I pray that we all uh, learn a practical lesson to be better Christians tomorrow than we were today. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share your work, and I also thank you for these men and their willingness to take time to be here, to make it a priority to do this. We thank you for these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, Zechariah chapter 12. Um, I think that we'll do just a couple of very basic introductory things, which I've done a couple of times. I've had an opportunity to share Zechariah just so you have a sort of overall gestalt of where Zechariah fits in biblical redemptive history. This is an overview of the whole Old Testament. So Zechariah is way over here, you know, in this Ezra Nehemiah period. It's just on the initial cusp of the 400 year time frame between the end, what we call the end of the Old Testament, and Jesus Christ's presence on earth. So it's right at the very beginning of that. Malachi was actually the last prophet to prophesy, but Zechariah was just shy of that. So we're right in there. Um, the children of Israel who were um, carried away in the Babylonian captivity have come back to the land under the Edict of Cyrus, which you may remember, and they're rebuilding the temple and rebuilding the wall. So that's where we're at. A couple other introductory things, and I don't want this to be a history lesson, but just... So he was one of the three prophets that, after the return of the people to Israel, uh, about the same time as Haggai, so Zechariah, Haggai, and Malachi are all in that area. Um, Zechariah and Haggai are actually mentioned in the book of Ezra, so again, they're right in that time frame. Uh, he prophesied from 522 to 509, remember BC years count down to zero. Jesus Christ being the fulcrum. He wasn't actually born in 0 BC, probably, but we still recognize that as he's the fulcrum. So before that, it comes down to him, and then it comes up, which is where we are, and we're in the AD, uh, which stands for Anadami here. <coughs> and then uh, the temple was completed in four years. We don't have to, I don't know, we have to rehash that. They laid the foundation of the temple according to, actually, let's see right here. Um, Cyrus's edict, as I mentioned, was in 536. The foundation of the temple was laid in Ezra, uh, chapter 3, verse 10. You'll see that they laid the foundation of the temple. <clears throat> this is rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. Um, the work ceases then because they encountered um, obstruction from people up in the Samaritan area. They weren't Jews. They were, I mean, people had been transplanted there by Assyrians, so they weren't native peoples at all. They came down and tried to obstruct the whole building. So the whole thing was in disarray for about 15 or 16 years. Again, they laid the foundation, but that's all the further they got. They got their their um, resistance from up north. They quit doing it 15 or 16 years later. And that's when Haggai and Zechariah are on the scene to kickstart this thing. You know, God is having them prophesy to the people. We're not going to rehash some of that stuff, but Haggai's, the beginning of Haggai, Haggai chapter 1 is great for that. He just calls them with the carpet because they're behaving toward themselves better than they would behave toward God in building the temple. Um, Zechariah begins prophesying in the second year of Darius. Again, we don't need to go into that too much. And then the temple is finished in the sixth year of Darius. So from the time they restarted to the time they finished, it was four years. So it starts, 15-year hiatus, they restart, four years later they're done. And so it's... That's the context in which Zechariah is prophesied. Overall structure of Zechariah, again, just by way of gestalt. I mean, we're in this last section tonight, but there's an introduction from chapter 1, verse 7 to chapter 6, verse 8. There are eight visions that he outlines, all that probably happened in one night based on what we can understand from the text. Um, in 6, 9 through 15, there's a kind of a crowning of Joshua, who was the high priest at that time, but it's also prophetic of what Messiah would be in his glory, 
not in not the crucified Jesus, but the glorified Jesus. Um, 7 1 3 23 is regarding the mourning for Jerusalem. 9 1 through 11 17 is God's interaction with Israel up to the coming of Christ. Now, what we're going to read about is in chapter 12 is God's interaction more with Israel in the future. After the, what, <coughs> relative to end time events and the glorified Christ. That's really what we're going to look at. 12 to 14 is really uh, pretty much a united prophecy. It's just divided into chapters. Remember that chapters in general, at least in the English Bible, are artificial. Um, just because there's a chapter division there, it's <coughs> that way in, in the ancient text. Uh, translators many times did that just for logic, not because it was actually divided that way. So let's read Zechariah chapter 12. Um, would anyone like to read, if you're reading a, a I usually use the King James Version, even though DA doesn't agree with that. <laughs> um, but I have the King James that I would read if I read it. If, any, if someone else would like to read, that would be great. Would anyone else like to read it? And if you do, read loudly. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think there's, what, 14, 14 verses, I think? 14. Uh, you can read the whole thing if you want to. That's fine. It says, The burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to the, to the uh, surrounding peoples, when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in the day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. In that day, says the Lord, I will strike every horse with confusion and its rider with madness. I will open my eyes on the house of Judah and will strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say at heart, Their inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength and the Lord of hosts, their God. In that day, I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile, like a fiery torch in the sheaves, and they shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place. Jerusalem. The Lord will save the tents of Judah first, so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall not become greater than that of Judah. In that day the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David, and the house of David shall be like God like the angel of the Lord before them. It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against it, Jerusalem. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one who mourns for his only son and grieve for him as he grieves for a firstborn. In that day there shall be a great morning in Jerusalem, like the morning at Hadad, Ramon, in the plain of Megiddo. And land shall mourn, every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves. And the family of Shimei by itself and their wives by themselves. All the families that remain, every family by itself and their wives by themselves. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, the first thing we'll look at is in chapter 12, verse 1, when it says... Uh, Thus says the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Essentially, essentially the prophecy is, is strong, is, has carrying power because of God's omnipotence. That's what those verses are saying. And in particular, I just wanted to point out this, the word for form. It's the Hebrew word yatsar. Um, and it's interesting because uh, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and you can either turn to these or simply look on the screen. Some I'll have you actually turn to. But uh, 
and the Lord God formed, and that's the word Yatsar, man out of the dust of the ground, breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The next place this used is in the next verse. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And the only other place that's used in Genesis is, and out of the ground the, out of the, ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field. So don't know exactly, don't know exactly what that um, <coughs> looked like. I mean, I know that God spoke into being man, but this word formed means to form something like a potter would form something out of clay. And Pastor David has before mentioned there's a that man is a kind of a three part being. God in First Thessalonians chapter five. Um, I pray God your most spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and the words in Genesis, we're not going to go into the other two, but the words in Genesis, there are kind of three words used in Genesis regarding the formation of man. One is formed, one is made, and one is created. So there were sort of three separate acts. Um, the spirit part we lost because we chose to disobey. And we didn't get that back until the new birth. That's when we, once again, have a spiritual connection. Before that, if you read in the Old Testament, and even John the Baptist and even Jesus, um, the spirit was upon, but not in. It couldn't be in, it was upon. And those prepositions are very important in that context. <laughs> it's a very important distinction. But I wanted to mention that because this prophecy, any prophecy, any word of God, um, and we'll see this later, um, we'll look at Matthew 5.18 in the context of sort of a practical way that God preserved his word. But Matthew 5.18, Jesus Christ says not one jot or one tittle is, you know, is going to be unfulfilled. Everything is going to be fulfilled of God's word. When we read something in God's word, it doesn't matter whether we believe it. It doesn't matter whether we believe it. It doesn't matter whether we see it ever come to pass. It doesn't change the fact that it is God's word. If you stand on the top of a building and you jump off, whether you believe in the law of gravity or not, you're going to die. <laughs> it doesn't make any difference. It's a principle. It's going to work. The word of God is the same way. If God states a principle, it is going to happen whether you believe it or not. You either go with the principle or break yourself upon it. One of the two. And this, the other thing I wanted to mention, um, and I think it's important just in studying the Bible to remember that it's an Eastern book. A lot of the imagery in it is Semitic, just like anything we would read nowadays in the newspaper. It's tied to our culture. It's very culturally based. There are going to be similes, analogies, mentions of things that people in our culture are going to understand. People outside our culture are not. Um, and this expression here, Behold, I will make Jerusalem in the New King James a cup of drunkenness. It's actually in um, the sort of literal or literal rendering in Hebrew is a, a bowl of reeling. And uh, this this idea of a cup, we see it in other places. Let's look at a couple of other examples. Um, in John 18, 11, then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? So the idea of a cup and of partaking of that and there being circumstances that were involved in that and that followed because of that. Uh, and that's what Zechariah chapter 12 is talking about, except in Je Zechariah chapter 12, and you'll see this at times in the Old Testament, it's sort of the cup of God's wrath. Now, usually the metaphor is cup. In Zechariah 12 too, you'll notice the first part of the, the chapter and this isn't mentioned a lot in the Old Testament. I've heard Pastor David mention that in end times, prophecy would, <coughs> would indicate that everybody's going to be against Jerusalem right, and Judah. Everybody's going to be against them. And that's true, but it's not mentioned that much. It's essentially Zechariah 12 and Zechariah 14. It's not mentioned much other than that. But the first part of this chapter, we see that everybody's going to be against them. And we see God fighting for them. Right? And part of this is, this metaphor, instead of a cup, it's a bowl, because there's going to be all nations against Israel, and they all get to drink out of that bowl. Out of a cup, one person drinks. Out of a bowl, everybody gets to drink. It's going to be a bowl of reeling. This reason, and the reason it's called reeling is, they're going to be reeling from God's wrath. That is to say, God's fighting for Israel. That's why the metaphor is used. <clears throat> 
Um, the other place where an analogy like this occurs is Revelation 14.10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Again, you just see that metaphor. So, whenever these end times come, of course, we don't know that. Um, let me be careful to say, um, everybody look at, I don't have this on the screen, so actually look at Psalm 13, 32, if you would. I mean, whatever your Bible or device of choice is. Mark 13, 32. Mark 13.32. Mark 13.32. Um, and this is at the end of some of the prophecies that Jesus Christ makes not long before His Passion. <clears throat> and there are parallel verses in the other Gospels. But these would be the prophecies such as occur in Matthew 24 and 25. There. So in Mark 13.32, um, after these prophecies... Talking about God's word uh, <coughs> here. In verse 31, it says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And then verse 32, But of that day and that hour knows no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Now, the only thing I want to point out is we don't know. That's all I want to point out. We don't know. Now, are we closer now than we were yesterday? Yes, absolutely. Do we know when it's going to happen? No, we don't. And many times, I think in Christianity, we become distracted by trying to predict end time events when we should be living Christian lives in the present because it doesn't change how we should be living now, even if it happens tomorrow. It doesn't change how we should be living as Christians. It doesn't change that we should be giving. It doesn't change that we should be witnessing. It doesn't change that we should be fellowshipping. It doesn't change that we should be praying. Nothing changes. If Jesus Christ comes back in a minute, doesn't change anything. So sometimes I think we get distracted with that. <clears throat> In any case, this the bowl of reeling, I thought, this is going to be massive because everybody's going to be against Judah and Jerusalem, and God is going to take care of them all. He's going to let them drink of his wrath from this bowl. Not just a cup, a bowl. And he's going to uh, there's going to be no question who's fighting for whom, based on what we read in Zechariah chapter 12. Let's see. I just wanted to point out these two, and now there may be others. I'm, I'm by no means, um, I, I, I am by no means a real student of prophecy. I don't claim any kind of, you know, wide knowledge of prophecy. When I looked in the Old Testament and used the tools that I know of that do good cross-referencing, I could only find a couple of places where there are specific prophecies about. <coughs> Everybody being against you in Jerusalem. Okay. These are the only two I can find. These chapters that we're looking at now. 12 to 14. So in Zechariah 14, 2. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken. And the houses rifled. And the women ravished. And that means just what it says. Ravished. <laughs> and what that Hebrew word actually means is the women lay down. That's literally what that word means. Lay down. <clears throat> And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Now, I can't begin to reconcile those two passages to you. Because one indicates it's going to be terrible for Jerusalem. And in chapter 12 when we read, Jerusalem is going to be the total and complete victor. I can't begin to reconcile those for you. But, every word of God is going to come to pass, just as we read it. That's all I can tell you. But again, what the two, the common thing that these two passages have is, in end times, everybody's going to be against Judah and Jerusalem. Now, the fact that that may seem to be happening now, I don't know if that's an indication of end times or not. I think it's easy to get distracted with that. So, again, that's me. I'm not saying there's a chapter and verse that says you're distracted. I'm not saying that. Um, let's look at Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Let's read this just in the King James again, because there's a mistranslation here, and I think it's important that you know that. There's a mistranslation in the English translation of Zechariah 12.10. So, 
And this is sort of the line of demarcation between the first nine verses talking about the everybody against Jerusalem part and the second part of the chapter, verses 10 through 14. Um, the, the second part of this chapter, really, when you think about it, it, it is the culmination in many ways in God's view of redemptive history. Because these five verses describe Israel as a nation accepting Messiah. So it starts in verse 10. And it says there in English, in the King, New King James, And I will pour on the house of David and on the heavens of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. So, um, so, you may be reading a translation which translates that differently. Let's just look at some other English translations because it can be either translated, and I'll show you why. It can be either translated, they will look on me whom they pierced, or they will look on him whom they pierced. Now, let's skip ahead so that this is clear to you because I know this going in, but you don't. Okay, so this verse is quoted in the New Testament in John 19, 37. It's right there, okay? But when the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, for the with came there out of blood water, he saw their record, and his record is true. He knows that he says true, and you might believe, for these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, the other scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Now, that's the fundamental reason why I say Zechariah 12.10 in the Old Testament is mistranslated. Because this, by revelation, by inspiration, John wrote down and wrote it correctly. Now we're going to go back and look at that and, and we'll look at a little bit of why. So in your study of the Bible, I don't know if what sorts of things you use. Sometimes I just use good old paper books. It's refreshing sometimes just to have a paper concordance that I can look at the word. Sometimes I use a computer. Uh, one of the computer tools that is available to you that you may use is called Bible Gateway. It's a website. It has multiple translations. So if I look up Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10 on Bible Gateway, um, and then I say, click, see in all English translations, there are 51 of them. There are 51 translations available that they have on there. Right? Of those translations, um, 12, I think it is, don't translate this verse like we read it in the New King James. They translate it. And I can show you what these translations are. I brought the list in case you actually want to look. I'm not going to burden you with the specific titles of the translations, but if you did want to look, I have that, and it's on the website as well. So, this translation, they will look at me concerning the one whom they pierce. When they see the one they pierce with a spear, they will mourn and weep for him. They will look at the one whom they stabbed to death, and they will mourn for him. They will look on him whom they pierce. So that when they look on him whom they have thrust through, they will look on him whose side they cut. When they look on the one whom they have pierced, that's a group of four translations in sort of successive editions. And when they look on him whom they have pierced, that's a series of two translations in, again, successive editions. So Zechariah 12.10, as we read it in the King James or the New King James, is actually mistranslated. Primarily because John 19.37 doesn't quote it that way. Right? And the reason, I, the reason I thought about this, first of all, it's just because of the accuracy of God's Word. It's important that we be accurate. And as an analogy, I think of somebody like, Joel's not in here, but as an IT person. Okay, so let's say that, I don't know if you guys know much about computers. But there is a kind of computer command you can execute, which is something called the command line. It's just a very basic, fundamental operating system kind of thing. There's no graphical interface, there's no mouse, there's no nothing. There's just a C, colon, right arrow, and slash, right? And you're supposed to put a command there, so you type a command in there. And there's a very limited set of commands that'll work there. And um, if you have one character wrong, it ain't gonna work. One character. So you have to be very accurate. Another analogy. I'm guessing that if you mismeasure something when you're building a house, 
that can have serious consequences, especially depending on where you mismeasure. Let's say that you mismeasure the foundation a little bit. Maybe it's slightly higher on one side than on the other. It's going to mess everything else up. Right? So you have to be accurate. It's the same thing with God's Word. That's why something like, they will look on me whom they pierced, versus they will look on him whom they pierced, is important. Now, I am not saying everybody's got to be Greek scholars or look at Bible Gateway and look at 51 translations. Not saying that. I'm only saying that it's important in our study of God's Word, our individual study of God's Word, that we're truly trying to study and understand. That we're looking at details. That we're not... I don't want... Um, I don't want to be disrespectful to Christianity or Christians in general, but I think it's accurate to say most Christians don't read the Bible. If they do read the Bible, they don't remember it. Or if they do read it, they don't necessarily read it to the end of understanding, remembering, and with the attitude that it's God's Word. I will just <coughs> tell you that we have to be a cut above that. We have to treat God's Word like 2 Timothy 3.16 talks about all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. We have to treat it that way in our thinking. It is the light to our path. It is our rule of faith and practice. We have to study it in that way. And I don't mean just read. I mean actually some detailed study. Now again, I'm not talking about your nose in the book 24 hours. I'm just talking about, you know, as an example, as another example. Look at, look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 8. How many of you uh, exercise or have ever tried to exercise? You know, on a routine basis. No? Okay. So nowadays, it's a big deal to exercise. There's a lot of publicity about it. You can buy special clothes for it. You can join a gym. You can go to the Y. You can buy equipment from home. Everybody's all about exercise, right? So 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Actually, let me start verse 7. Refuse profane and old wives' tables and exercise thyself rather than godliness. For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable to all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So, for my, I'm a physical therapist by trade. I mean, that's what I do for a day job. Okay? So, I believe in exercise, obviously. Right? That's what I want to get people to do. So, I myself try to practice what I preach. So, I exercise three times a week. Right? It takes me probably about an hour each time. And I'm lifting weights, they're vigorous, I'm doing stuff that probably most people my age can't do because they don't exercise. Not because they couldn't, just they just don't exercise. So the point being, I devote three hours a week to that. Plus, like getting to the gym, getting back from the gym, taking a shower, all the affiliated stuff. And I thought I was I was recently actually I, I write kind of a in my Bible study, I, I try to write things up that I study and send to my kids. Because what I'm trying to do is continue to practice Deuteronomy 6-7, that I'm talking about God's Word with them. I'm trying to continue to do that with the stuff I send them. Now, whether they read it or not is up to them, but I'm still sending them. So I'm fulfilling my responsibility. So I was writing one recently on the Greek word paideia, which is the word for training or discipline, right? It's like physical training or discipline or spiritual too. So I was saying in there, just what I told you, I exercise three hours a week. Do I devote, and I had to ask myself honestly, do I devote that much time to detailed study of God's Word if I don't have to teach? Frankly, no, I don't. I don't devote as much time to detailed study of God's Word as I do to my physical body. And yet, 1 Timothy 4.8, bodily exercise profits little. Or the King James actually has a great margin of reading to and it says, for a little time. It profits for now. But godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. So, getting back to you know, how this relates to all this stuff. A mistranslation, it's important because the accuracy of God's word is important. It's important for us because it's important as men, as husbands, as fathers, as leaders in the church, the accuracy of God's word is important. Um, let's take a two-minute break. Okay? Really, truly. Stand up and <coughs> greet somebody, give somebody a hug, walk and get a drink of water. You got two minutes. Okay? Stretch your legs.
Get tired of me talking.
not an iota, not a comma. Not the smallest letter, but not a particle is, is another translation. The iota is the smallest Greek vowel, which Matthew here uses to represent the Hebrew yod, that little apostrophe thing that I told you. The smallest Hebrew letter is the apostrophe. So Matthew uses the Greek word titulus, which came to mean the stroke above an abbreviated word. Then and then any small mark. So in old manuscripts, because so they because remember these were all hand copied, right? There was no such thing as a printing press until 1450. So a guy gets a manuscript, a scribe gets a manuscript. The only way to reproduce that is hand copy every single letter. So to for commonly used words such as the word for God in the New Testament, they would abbreviate because then they don't have to write so much. So they would write the first letter, which in Greek is a theta, and they'd write the last letter, which in Greek is a sigma, and it looks like an English S, and they'd put a line over it, because that meant it was an abbreviation, right? Then they knew it wasn't another word, it was an abbreviation. That's this word, tittle, you know, that's this word, this Latin word title, it was because they used it as an abbreviation. It was a small mark to indicate, okay, that means God. But there was only two letters, and in the Greek word for God, there are four. Okay? So... That's what he's talking about here. Um, let's look at... This is so interesting, too. Um, this is another note from this Bible, actually. From this study Bible. It's called the Companion Bible. The fellow that did it um, happened to know another gentleman who compiled the... You can see in this Hebrew Bible, you see these little bitty, bitty, bitty letters in the margin. Okay? So those were called the Masora. And the Masora were um, the, the scribes who would copy this stuff. They would count the letters in the whole book, or count all of the words and determine the middle word. And the reason they did this was that they got a faithful copy. That they knew that their copy was exactly like the that there were the same number of letters, that it was the same middle word, etc., etc. That's what the Messiah was referred to as a fence around the scripture. It was a way for them to absolutely have a faithful copy of God's word. That's how important God's word was to them. These guys devoted their lives to this, right? We don't even read the Bible sometimes in English, but we can only sit here and have the Bible in our language because these guys devoted their lives to it. And we're talking over like you know, 3,000 years this stuff was written, they devoted their lives to this. This is all they did. As an example, this notation. <coughs> ah, right here. So then again, this is from this Bible. And he, um, I started to say, he had a, a personal relationship with a fellow named Christian Ginsburg, who devoted his life to compiling those, those Masora things, those comments. He compiled. So one of the comments about this, this letter Yod is he says the Greek Yoda occurs only here, that's the Greek word. It's the smallest Hebrew letter, that's that Yod. The Master writes numbers, the number 66,420 of them. So in the Old Testament, it occurred 66,420 times. Now, if they got a copy that that didn't work, they threw the copy away. They burned it. And they started all over again. On a page by page basis. They would do counts on a page by page, but if that page wasn't good, destroy it. Now, the only reason I bring all that up is not to bore you with details, but to emphasize to you how important God's Word should be to us. How important is it that we can... I mean, how much... I know that I take for granted tremendously that I can just sit down and read the English Bible, for heaven's sake. What an amazing thing. How important that should be to us, to be able to read and... Um, Feast on, so to speak, God's word. And this is just so that you understand a little more about the Masterites, only because I admire these guys. They literally devoted their lives to transmitting faithfully God's word so that we have it today. And they, this was over, these are the guys that put all those vowel marks in the Hebrew text that weren't there in the first place. If this is like from the 2nd to the 5th century AD, you know, after Christ. They put all those vowel pointings and all those squiggly, squiggly things, they put all that stuff in there to faithfully reproduce the text. 
That's what we look at when you look at a Hebrew Bible nowadays, what they did. Anyway, the Hebrew word Masor is taken from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 20, verse 37, and means originally leg cuffs. Essentially, it was restraints, right? Those commas were supposed to be restraints to the text so it didn't get away from them, so it didn't become inaccurate. And, it, and it, uh, the fixation of the test was considered to be in the nature of leg cuffs upon its exposition. When, in the course of time, the Masor had become a traditional discipline, the term became connected with the verb uh, Masar, is that those Hebrew letters are really pronounced Masar, to hand down and acquired the general meaning of tradition. So not all traditions are bad. Some traditions are good. Right? Thessalonians talks about, um, Paul talks to them about obeying, um, uh, them obeying what they had been taught, whether by word or our, our epistle. The traditions they had been taught, whether by word or our epistle. So not all traditions are bad. Oh, yeah. And this is cool. This is another thing along the same lines of accuracy. So, and you may you may have seen this. They did this in Latin and Greek manuscripts too. They were what was called illuminated. That is to say, they were simply illustrated. They were decorated. Right. So they would use they would get individual letters. Like the first letter is a Greek aleph. So to ornament it, to decorate it, they would put those horns on there. That's not part of the letter. That's just ornamentation. That's it's just right. But. There were always a certain number on there. So let's just read the note. You can see the other examples. These ornamented letters were quite exceptional and implied no added meaning of any kind. But so jealously was the sacred text safeguarded that the scribe was informed how many of each of the letters had these little ornaments. So if you had three of those first letters that had those ornaments and in your copy there was a fourth one, you got a problem. So they counted those, right? Didn't change any meaning, but it helped them get a faithful copy. Again, the important thing is not that we're all going to become scribes and hand copy manuscripts. The important thing is how critical is the accuracy of God's word to us? Right. Um, another kind of practical example, and again, I don't want to be disrespectful to anybody or anything, but in our SOD class, which I, if you haven't taken it, I encourage you to take it. It's a great class. One of the things we will do in there is memorize scripture, right? And we'll usually memorize from the New King James Version. And I, again, not being disrespectful, but I've been able to, not, you don't instruct that class, you just sort of, um, you know, oversee, because you're essentially reading scriptures or reading the syllabus. But it's a rare case when somebody actually recites a verse correctly verbatim. And how hard is that? How hard is that? Really? I mean, we're talking about a few Bible verses here. You, you and I, too, probably know song lyrics from our youth verbatim. Do we know the Bible that well? Not so sure. And it's a rare case. Because I've been there in classes larger and smaller. It's a rare case when they actually say it right. How important is God's word to us? And I ask myself the same, as I told you, I use that illustration. I ask myself the same question. I mean, do I devote as much time to critical, to, to detailed study as I do to physical exercise? Well, no, I don't. That was convicting for me. Oh, I wanted to, this Hadadrima, I just wanted to mention, because when you run across a term like that, you know, you think, what in heaven's name is that? So I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on that. Um, it's mentioned, and you can you don't have to go there, but in 2 Chronicles 35, 22 to 25, first of all, the name, it's um, a place in the valley of Megiddo. It is actually named, I believe, for two Syrian idols, right? That's a compound name of two Syrian idols. But it's the reason that it's a, an example of national mourning is that Josiah, who was one of the very few really, really, really good kings, and if you want to see some of his great kingship, read earlier in this chapter, but we'll read just here. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him. He goes out to fight when he shouldn't have done that. Um, but disguised himself that he might fear them, and hearkened not unto the words of Necho from the mouth of God, and came to fight in the valley of Gidon. And the archers shot at King Josiah, and the king said to his servants, 
Have me away, for I am sore wounded. His servants therefore took him out of that chariot and put him in the second chariot that he had. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died and was buried in one of the sepulchers of his fathers. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah, and Jeremiah lamented for Josiah. And all the singing men and the singing women spake of Josiah in their lamentations to this day, and made them an ordinance in Israel, and behold, they are written in the lamentations. That is why this expression appears in Zechariah chapter 12 as an example of a national mourning. Now, the mourning that... So, the analogy here is that you know, that's national mourning, but then what Jerusalem, what Israel is going to be mourning for is what they did to Messiah. And just, just think about that for a minute. When a nation, God's chosen nation, whom He has tried to bring to Him for millennia now, finally recognize that Jesus Christ is Messiah. That's what Zechariah chapter 12 talks about. That they are finally going to see. They're going to look on Him whom they pierced, and they're going to mourn for Him like they would for their firstborn. It's finally going to happen. Now, I don't know all of what that entails, but just wrap your mind around that. Because that's what God has wanted, truly, for thousands of years. That's what He wanted. Anyway, that's why Hadad Ramon is used as an example of national mourning. Because Josiah, who died there, who was, again, I encourage you to read, was a great king. And Israel had none, Judah had few. Josiah was one of them. So when he was killed, there was much more. Um, I, and, and so Zechariah 12 talks about essentially what is the repentance of Israel, the turning back to God, the acceptance of Messiah. Right, that's what he really talks about. And I thought of these verses simply because, you know, when Messiah was here, Israel could have done this. Acts 2.36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Or Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So if Israel had accepted Messiah at that point, I don't know what history would have looked like. I don't know. But the point is, in Zechariah 12, they actually do. They actually recognize what they did. They look on Him whom they pierced, and they accept Him as Messiah. And... That's all I have. Um, I'll close in prayer, and then if anybody has any questions or comments. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you again for your word. and Thank you so much for preserving it to us. I thank you for <clears throat> all of the men down through the centuries who either gave their lives, living their lives, or gave their lives in death so that we could have a written Bible today. Thank you so much, and I pray, Heavenly Father, that we <coughs> um, invest your word with that same importance in our lives, that we see that it is quick, that it is powerful, that it is God-breathed, as you say in 2 Timothy 3.16, that it is, it should be our, our bread every day. Thank you again for these men. Thank you for their making Bible study a priority. And thank you for your goodness to all of us. That we live in a free country. That you gave us a church in which we can gather like this without fear of persecution. Thank you for these things. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.